I am Helen. I am a 35-year-old working mother. My daughter, Shirley, turned five this year and is in her second year of kindergarten. She loves playing with dolls. My husband, Anthony, adores her and often takes her out on weekends. Don't tell mom, okay? It's between you and dad. He says as he treats her to ice cream and flan. Even though it's supposed to be a secret from me, I always find out because Shirley tells me. Mom, don't tell anyone, but... I enjoy my simple and peaceful daily life. Except for one thing. Every summer, as usual, we visit my in-law's home, and I am made to prepare lunch. When I handed over the gift of fruits, my M.I.L., Linda, openly frowned. Oh dear, I don't like fruits from this place. That can't be true. Anthony told me that she loves fruits from this store. I held back and put the box away. I'm sorry. I'll take it back then. It's okay. I'll take it since you brought it. All right. She snatched the box from my hands, looking delighted, and stuffed the fruits into the refrigerator. Later, when I made soup with store-bought bouillon, we make ours by boiling meat bones and vegetables, she said as she poured it down the sink. When the soup was finally ready, she had various criticisms. In the end, my plate was full of scraps of meat and fish bones. She is like an old woman in a comic book who bullies her son's wife. Anthony is usually busy with yard work while I'm in the kitchen, so he doesn't notice Linda's bullying. When the food situation is blatantly strange, he does speak up. But Linda just feigns innocence and says, Oh dear, I was just careless. Anthony always sighs and swaps his plate with mine, which only irritates Linda more. I think she should just stop the harassment, but maybe it's her life's purpose. I can still tolerate the bullying directed at me. What I can't stand is when she involves my daughter in her harassment. During summer vacations, Anthony's sister, Anna, her husband, and their seven-year-old son, Gary, usually visit my in-law's home. Linda spoils my sale Anna. Linda never lets Anna do any kitchen work. If I dare ask Anna for help, Linda glares at me and says, How dare you make the in-law's daughter work when you're the son's wife? How dare you make the in-law's daughter work when you're the son's wife? Like mother, like daughter. Anna also lazes around, playing on her smartphone, without helping out when she's at the in-law's home. Linda's excessive love even extends to her son, Gary. Here, Gary, a present for you. It's the video game software you've wanted for a while. Look, Gary. Say thank you to Grandma. Thank you. Gary takes the software without even looking at her, while playing his video game, and both Linda and Anna smile contentedly. Then Linda carelessly hands something small to Shirley. Here, Shirley, this is for you. Isn't it cute? Huh? Linda tossed over a small notebook with a cat on the cover, something I'd seen somewhere before. Oh, I've seen this at the dollar store. Shirley points it out with a pure, delighted smile, causing Linda's mouth to twitch slightly. Hey, Shirley. Well, well, just like your mom. It's the thought that counts, not the price. Make sure you learn that from your mom. Linda turns her blunder into a snide comment about my poor upbringing. Anna, finding the situation amusing, bursts into laughter. I felt my anger rising, but before I could say anything, Anthony, always protective of our daughter, spoke up. Mom, I've told you to stop showing favoritism to the grandchildren. It's not favoritism, it's differentiation. Of course, there's a difference between a kindergartner and an elementary school student. There's only a two-year age difference. The arguing adults made Shirley look anxious and Gary uncomfortable. Bullying me even in front of the kids is truly childish. Anna, meanwhile, watches the scene with a gleeful smile. 
Reluctantly, I decided to take Gary and Shirley away when my FIL, Bill, who had been working in the field, showed up. What's going on? Did Linda do something to make Anthony angry again? Bill. All right. Shirley and Gary, how about some shaved ice with Grandpa? Come on, Helen, join us. The mango shaved ice there is the best. Sure. Yay! I love Grandpa. Ha 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 ha. He pats Shirley's head happily. Gary, too, seems relieved as he holds his hand. In this way, Linda openly shows favoritism between my Sael's son and my daughter. Returning to the in-laws' home isn't good for my mental health or Shirley's upbringing. Anthony understands this, so we've only been visiting during summer vacations and Christmas in recent years. Even that is painful, but he is a good person and Shirley is fond of him, so we haven't decided to cut ties. Moreover, even Linda doesn't bully Shirley with words or actions if Gary isn't around. I thought I could endure it. However, that was a big misunderstanding. Summer vacation ended, and it was back to our usual routine with Anthony and I working and Shirley going to kindergarten. Since I finish work earlier, I usually pick Shirley up. But one day, Shirley started throwing tantrums, saying she wanted her dad to pick her up. That wasn't all. At home, she would cry and say, I want to eat with dad. I want to take a bath with dad. I want to sleep with dad. She cried and demanded that everything be with dad. Of course, Anthony's work schedule didn't allow for this, so I had to convince Shirley and take care of her myself most of the time. But on some days, she would cry so much insisting on dad that it would last until Anthony came home. Naturally, I'm also tired from work and I want Shirley to sleep early to be ready for kindergarten the next day. So, I couldn't help but feel irritated. At first, Anthony was happy, saying, She loves Dad that much, huh? But as her demands for Dad grew more intense every day, he became exhausted. This isn't normal. Sensing that something was wrong, we decided to ask Shirley about it. Shirley, why do you want Dad so much? Shirley, nervously clutching her skirt, responded to my serious question because dad is going to leave me, right? What? We were taken aback, and Shirley, growing impatient, cried out loudly. Because dad isn't my real dad, he's going to leave me, right? What? Anthony isn't her dad? Why does she think that? Puzzled, Anthony gently spoke to Shirley. Dad is your true dad. No, you're not. I don't look like dad at all. Indeed, Shirley's face is a spitting image of mine, to the point where you'd wonder where she left Anthony's jeans. Maybe someone at her kindergarten pointed that out to her. You may look like mom, but you are dad and mom's child. No, I'm not. No matter how much I tried to soothe her, Shirley stubbornly shook her head. Then, she shouted something outrageous. Because Grandma said that the reason I don't look like Dad is that Mom cheated. She said my real Dad is someone else. What? Anthony and I simultaneously shouted in reflexive anger. What has that old woman been telling our young girl? I struggled to contain my urge to storm over and kick down the door of the in-laws' home. Anthony, too, had veins popping out of his temple but he spoke to Shirley in a calm voice. Shirley, you are definitely dad's child. No. You're lying, yo me. It's not a lie. Your mom would never do anything to make you or dad sad. Right, Helen? Anthony looked straight at me. Of course, with nothing to hide, I looked right back at him. Of course not. Your dad could only be him. Really? When Anthony and I both nodded firmly, the tension drained from her little body. We gently pulled her into a hug. I'm sorry, Shirley. 
We didn't notice how anxious you were. You are absolutely mom and dad's child. We will always be with you. At my words, Shirley's face contorted. Wah. She cried out, her small body shaking. I held her, and tears streamed down my own face. That night, Anthony and I slept holding her hands. I had been naive. I didn't see how foolish Linda was, to plant such malicious lies in the mind of our young grandchild. I'm sorry, Shirley. Mom will fight for you. Anthony, lying on Shirley's left, was also filled with anger. We will not forgive Linda. Never, never forgive her. That weekend, we left Shirley with my mom at my parents' home and headed straight to the in-laws' home. Anna, who happened to be visiting, was sitting next to Linda, smirking as she ate ice cream. At first, Linda feigned ignorance, saying, Isn't she just mistaken? But when my husband and I pressed her, she quickly changed her tune. Well, isn't it true that Shirley doesn't resemble my son? Helen must have gotten pregnant by some other man. Oh, dear, getting all defensive because I hit the nail on the head. What? Anthony, wake up already. Shirley isn't your child. Divorce Helen and find a young, cute wife who suits you. I'll help you find one. Seriously, Anthony, you have no eye for women. I've already given birth to an heir, so it's fine even without Shirley. Just hold your cheating wife accountable and start all over. Mother. Anna. Anthony's temple throbbed with a visible vein at their outrageous remarks. I was furious but also astounded. How could someone assume that their son's wife cheated just because their grandchild doesn't resemble their son? Then it hit me. I voiced my thoughts. Wait. You say all this because you have had such an experience yourself, Linda. What? Linda's voice came out high-pitched. And she looked slightly pale. No way. Did I hit a nerve? What are you saying? I thought so. Normally, people wouldn't jump to the conclusion that a child doesn't resemble their parent because of an affair. But if Linda had such an experience herself, it makes sense. No! Mom! You don't mean! Anthony looked at Linda with disbelief. Even Anna, surprised, stared at Linda, her ice cream dripping from her hand. No, no, no! It's not true! If it's not true, why are you so flustered? Who is my real father? Anthony is Bill's child! Then Anna is the result of an affair? Oh! Linda covered her mouth with her hand. Anna, with her eyes and mouth wide open, looked at Linda in shock. Mom, really? No, no! Anna is also Bill's. Linda's trembling lips tried to make excuses. But a low, calm voice cut her off. So it was true. We all turned to see Bill, who had appeared from the living room, looking serious. Linda was visibly shaken. Bill? No, it's not true. I've never had an affair. Stop it, you're embarrassing yourself. Bill sighed deeply. I've had my suspicions. What? For five years after Anthony was born, we didn't have any more children. More accurately, we weren't even trying. So when you suddenly insisted on having another child and then got pregnant immediately, I found it odd. But the daughter that was born was so adorable, and I thought if I just endured and pretended not to notice, I could protect our family and our children. But it seems I was wrong about everything. No! No! Bill turned away from the shocked Linda and faced me. Helen, I'm sorry for all the discomfort Linda and Anna have caused you. Bill. But you don't have to worry anymore. From today, these two will no longer be part of mine or Anthony's family. What? Linda and Anna cried out in unison, 
their voices filled with despair. Linda, with a desperate expression, clung to his arm. Really, it's not true. Anna is genuinely your child. Are you going to believe the words of a D.I.L. with no substance over the wife you've been with for over 30 years? Mom, stop embarrassing yourself. Anthony, you shut. Anthony, exhausted by the situation, was sternly glaring at her. Bill, with a serious look, said softly. You're right. Yes, please, believe me. If Anna is proven to be my child, I'll believe you. If not, get out. Bill? Bill mercilessly pushed away Linda, whose eyes were wide with despair. If a DNA test proves you're my child, I'll believe you. Otherwise, get out. No way. Linda, pale as ash, sank to the floor. Our feet. Beside her, Anna stood in shock, a puddle of melted ice cream forming at he. Unlike me, Linda's infidelity and the resulting misattributed paternity were almost certainly true. If she had just left things alone, she wouldn't be in this mess. A saying that perfectly fit Linda came to mind. A truly a foolish person. The next day, Anthony got a DNA testing kit and, after much resistance from Linda and a stunned Anna, managed to collect their cells. Science proved Anthony and Bill's parentage and disproved Bill and Anna's relationship. Bill mercilessly kicked out the dazed Linda and filed for divorce. Due to Linda and Anna's persistent visits, Bill sold the in-law's home and moved to a senior housing facility in his hometown. Linda lost most of her assets to Bill as compensation for years of deceit through her misattributed paternity. Linda, having lost both her home and financial support, tried to move in with Anna. However, in a surprising turn of events, Anna's husband, William, demanded a DNA test for Gary. It turned out that Anna had also been unfaithful, and although William had been aware of it, he hadn't confronted her for Gary's sake. But after witnessing the recent divorce drama of his PIL, William changed his mind. The DNA test confirmed that Gary was William's son, but since Anna's infidelity was undeniable, they divorced. Due to the severity of her actions and Gary's strong preference to stay with his father, William was granted custody of him. In the end, Anna lost her family, home, and financial support, and she and Linda were forced to live together in a small apartment. Both having been housewives, they struggled to find significant work and were now living in poverty. Meanwhile, Bill made it clear that he didn't want to leave any inheritance to Anna. Despite this, legally severing ties with Anna was not possible, as their parent-child relationship remained intact under the law. Bill thought. To reduce the amount Anna would receive from his estate, Bill decided to legally adopt both me and our daughter Shirley. By increasing the number of his heirs and properly setting up his will, her share would be minimized. Anna, who had once lived a lavish life on her husband's earnings, couldn't bear the situation. This is all your fault, Mom. She blamed her for everything, verbally abusing her daily. In desperation, Linda shamelessly came to our house, begging for help. Naturally, Anthony and I refused to take her in. Anthony, looking at her with disdain, told her to feel ashamed of herself. The commotion at the door caught Shirley's attention, and she appeared, curious. Seeing her, Linda's face lit up. Shirley! Please, tell your dad and mom to help your grandma. Grandma is being bullied by everyone. This woman. After all the pain she caused her, she had the nerve to ask this? As I moved to shield Shirley and tell Linda off, Shirley spoke up first. No! What? Linda was stunned, her mouth agape at the clear rejection from her granddaughter. She glared at her grandmother with an intensity I'd never seen before. I hate grandma because you tried to take dad away from me. What? I, uh... Linda's face turned pale. 
Had she forgotten her own misdeeds? Truly despicable. I won't do that anymore. Look, I'll buy you all the toys and sweets you like. Please? No. You are a big liar. Oh, no. It was almost surreal that a five-year-old child could speak more sensibly than her 63-year-old grandmother. But I couldn't let this go on any longer. Picking up the agitated Shirley, I turned to go back inside, but Linda, refusing to give up, tried to stop me. No matter how much she pleads, I will never forgive this woman. One more attempt to contact Shirley or us, and I'll call the police. Understood? Ah. With a pathetic whimper, she collapsed to the floor. Anthony picked her up and escorted her out of our house. Thus, Linda, consumed by her greed, ended up being reviled by her daughter, unable to see her grandchild, and condemned to a life of hard work until her end. A year later, during summer vacation, we invited Bill to our home. He came over happily. Bill was enjoying his life at the senior housing facility, spending time playing chess with friends and gardening in a nearby plot. Though he had been down after the divorce, he was now more lively than he had ever been when living in the in-laws' home. We often invited Bill over. And the lack of Linda and Anna made every visit stress-free and enjoyable. Helen, I found some really sweet watermelons at the market, so I bought one for you. Thank you, Bill. Where's Shirley? Bill, eager to see his beloved granddaughter, seemed restless. I put a finger to my lips to signal for silence and led him quietly down the hallway. Opening the living room door, I showed him Anthony and Shirley, both fast asleep from playing too hard, lying in the same position. Bill chuckled softly. They're so alike. Though Shirley didn't resemble Anthony physically, they were undeniably parent and child. They were my most precious family in the world. Look at that, such adorable eyes. It's been years since I've seen a baby up close. Just watching is soothing. Babies are truly wonderful. My younger sister, June, had given birth, and my in-laws insisted on coming from afar to see the baby. The baby, cradled by June, was sleeping soundly in the center of attention. You're being so good today, not crying. I wonder what kind of person you'll grow up to be. Yeah, babies are wonderful. Why don't we have one, Leah? In the room filled with warm sunlight, a whirlwind of emotions churned inside me. Well, well, babies are a blessing. All right, let's try for a baby. I want a child too. The moment I heard those words, I stood up slowly. Everyone's eyes turned sharply towards me. What? You already have one. You're the baby's dad, aren't you? All eyes in the room shifted to the baby. My name is Leah. I am 41 years old. I work part-time at a cafe in a shopping mall near our home. My husband, Rafe, is two years older than me and works as a long-haul truck driver, spending most of his time on the road. He comes home about once or twice a week. Since we both dislike being overly interfered with, we don't feel much loneliness. At least I don't, though if anything is lonely, it's that we don't have children. It's not that we never wanted them. When we married in our 20s, we thought it was just a matter of timing due to our youth and didn't think deeply about it. As I got older, our lack of children became more concerning, and we even tried fertility treatments, which were still rare at the time. I became increasingly anxious about the lack of results, but Rafe felt differently. We've been trying for so long without any success. There's no point in continuing. Maybe, but if we keep trying a bit longer, it might work. I'm tired from work, and spending my days off at the clinic is depressing. I'm healthy, maybe the problem is with you, Leah. With those words, Rafe stopped going to the treatments. Honestly, 
We didn't have a lot of extra money. Feeling resentment towards Rafe's words, I also gradually stopped going to the clinic. Good morning. You're up early again today. Good morning. I just woke up early. The greeting came from Debbie, who lives in the apartment below us. We've lived in this apartment for nearly 20 years, and Debbie has been here even longer. There are many long-term residents in this apartment. As a result, the age group is older, but everyone is kind and there are no neighborhood disputes. If there are any troubles, they're within the home. I muttered to myself where no one could hear. When I was younger, I dreamed that our time together would last forever. But now, the time Rafe spends at work is my only relief. Our relationship isn't outwardly bad, but after 20 years of marriage, our conversations have become scarce. Additionally, we've both naturally started avoiding the topic of children. One afternoon, the doorbell rang. Hey Leah, it's June. Come on in. Standing at the door was my younger sister, June, five years my junior. I started dating Rafe and moved in with him around the same time June graduated from high school and left home. Both June and I live fairly close to our childhood home. Since our mom moved into a nursing home, our dad, Alec, has been living there alone. Do you ever go check on dad? I've been too busy. Dad rarely answers the phone anyway. I guess he's doing fine. Figures. Dad may be reserved, but he gets lonely. You visit him often enough, so it's fine. You're really hands off, you know that? My dad Alec has always been a workaholic and a grumpy person with everyone. He left all the household chores to mom. Nowadays, he can manage basic tasks himself. But right after mom left, I was worried about him and visited him almost daily. Dad. Here's food for tomorrow's breakfast and lunch. You can microwave it in these containers. I've folded the laundry, so please put it away yourself. Oh, and also. Dad never said a word, but I continued visiting, resigned to the fact that's just how he is. In contrast, Rafe's parents live far away, in a snowy area where snow piles as tall as adults in winter. My in-laws are social butterflies, the opposite of my dad, and often visit us. By the way, Jeannie brought some persimmons last time. Would you like some? Not now, thanks. I've got a show to watch, so I'll head back before evening. I'll take some persimmons with me. All right, I'll get them ready. Rafe's parents come here often, don't they? Considering the distance. Jeannie always wanted to live in the city. She's happy just visiting them all. Yeah, you went out with them last month, didn't you? Unlike with some in-laws, I've never had any issues with Rafe's parents. They're open and honest. Well, I should get going. I want to stop by the convenience store. Be careful. It gets dark early these days. Don't sound like mom. We're both old enough to know that. When's your next day off? Let's go to that new cafe near the station. My next day off is probably Saturday. I'll call you. June checked her schedule on her smartphone as she put on her shoes. June lives just a couple of bus stops away. She often drops by our place, especially when she doesn't feel like cooking dinner. Sometimes she even stays the night, so we have a bed for her. Oh, by the way, Leah, I'm pregnant. What? How? Her unexpected announcement made me raise my voice. You know those dating apps? They're pretty fun. I met someone about a year ago, and things just happened. I've been feeling unwell and the doctor told me I'm three months pregnant. June laughed through her nose as she spoke. Really? Is he a good guy? I don't know if you'd think he's decent, but he's a good person. June's tone softened. 
maybe she felt guilty about meeting someone through a dating app. Well, congratulations. I guess. Sorry for getting pregnant before you, Leah. No, don't worry about it. The word stung, but I forced myself to be happy for June. Let me know if you need anything. Thanks. I will. June said as she left. A swirl of emotions churned inside me. I should be happy for her. I told myself. I told Rafe about June's pregnancy when he got home. Really? June's pregnant? With whom? Someone she met on a dating app. I haven't met him yet. Wow, that's something. Rafe, sitting on the sofa, finished his beer and turned around. Why don't we have any good news like that? What? Are we really bringing this up again? It's your fault for stopping the treatments. I'd love to hold my own child. You stopped the treatments first, Rafe. Don't blame me. I'm healthy. The problem is you. I dream of having kids. To high, I was the sole reason for our childlessness. I felt frustrated with Rafe and with myself for not being able to solve our issues together. From then on, he often made snide remarks about our lack of children. I wish I had a kid to watch over while they run errands. He'd say this while watching TV shows featuring children. Once, he even bought a book on fertility and threw it at me. I paid for this with your money. Study it well. Is it fair to be treated this badly just because we don't have kids? To distract myself, I often helped June with her baby. Cleaning the room, shopping, cooking, and so on. Sorry, Leah. My morning sickness is really bad. No worries, it's fine. June's room is always messy whenever I go there, and her meals seem to consist mostly of store-bought ready-made dishes and instant noodles. Having a baby in your belly is tough. Everything makes you tired. Oh, sorry, Leah. You wouldn't understand since you don't have a baby. She sometimes tries to assert dominance over me. She exaggerates the hardships of pregnancy at every opportunity. Yet, she doesn't seem to think about proper nutrition for the baby or prepare for its birth. I sometimes caution her, but it doesn't seem to resonate with June. June's baby was growing well, but I had one major concern. I had never seen the man who was supposed to be her husband. Aren't you going to introduce him to dad? He's often away on business trips. It's old-fashioned to think introductions are necessary. I see. Well, let's make it happen another time. Okay. She stood up as if to declare the conversation over. I had other thoughts but chose not to delve further. It wasn't the right time yet. Time passed and June gave birth to a healthy baby boy. June hesitated to inform Dad. They didn't talk much before. I'm worried he will be mad because it's out of order. Really? He accepted it easily when it was my turn. After much prodding from me, June finally made the call to report the birth to Alec. Despite June's worry, our father showed no emotion and simply said, I see. In contrast, when I reported June's childbirth to Rafe's parents, they reacted as if it was their own grandchild. Leah, I'd love to send a gift. Would that be okay? With that, they started sending baby gifts through Rafe, diaper cakes, bibs, and baby clothes. Eventually, they couldn't hold back and expressed a strong desire to meet the baby. Travis and Jeannie want to meet the baby. What? It has nothing to do with me. You received so many gifts. It won't hurt to meet them. June was initially reluctant, but she eventually gave in. I arranged a gathering at my home, turning it into a celebration with a feast of food. Oh, look at those adorable eyes! Really? It's been years since I saw a baby up close. Rafe's parents were overjoyed. 
Rafe also attended, making it seem like a joyous occasion. Ah, babies are wonderful. Why haven't we been blessed with one, Leah? Well, babies are a gift, after all. But after almost 20 years, and we still don't have one. Maybe there's something wrong with us. That's not true. All right, let's try for a baby. I want one too. As soon as I heard that, I stood up slowly. Everyone's eyes turned to me. What? You already have one. Isn't the baby yours? I pointed to the baby sleeping peacefully in June's arms. Everyone was speechless, and the room fell into an eerie silence. June was the first to speak, quickly laying the baby down and glaring at me. What are you talking about? Are you losing it because you can't have kids? Exactly. Are you saying Leah and I had an affair? That's ridiculous. Rafe's parents still looked puzzled by the exchange. Got it. You're trying to say anything to claim the baby as your own. It's shameful as a sister. You've always blamed others. Isn't it your fault we can't have kids? As Jeannie tried to calm Rafe, I pulled out my smartphone. I decided not to trust either of you after seeing this. The screen showed photos of June's home. I displayed a series of photos I had taken. They showed Rafe leaving June's house and the two of them embracing passionately. Rafe and June, who had been insulting me moments ago, were now speechless, their faces pale. These were taken three years ago. Why do you have those? You were oddly excited when June stayed over. And June, you clung to him. I was worried. That's just a part of showing affection. Debbie who lives downstairs, told me she heard a woman's voice. I had just come back from my part-time job. It's strange, isn't it? Debbie must have been mistaken. Maybe she heard the TV. Oh, you said you were working that day, but you were home. At first, I thought it was some unknown woman. I didn't want to believe it, but to confirm, I tracked your smartphone's GPS. You had no right to do that. When I tracked it, it showed June's house. That alone wasn't enough proof, but I didn't have the courage to go there myself. So, I asked someone to take these photos. The shock I felt when I saw those photos still suffocates me just thinking about it. But more than that, the frustration and anger prevailed. I always suspected you too. Did you think you could keep it hidden? I have gathered more evidence than you can imagine. So, you doubted my pregnancy announcement too? It was shocking. I wanted to believe it was a lie. But June, you've always avoided eye contact and tried to leave the scene when lying. You did the same when I asked about your partner. What are you talking about? The atmosphere in the room was heavy and oppressive. It felt like weights were tied to my legs, pulling me down. But I couldn't back down now. If I didn't settle this today, I'd regret it forever. This, this is a mistake. It's all a lie. Rafe, did you betray Leah? My father-in-law's voice was trembling. Jeannie looked like she was about to cry. I felt guilty for involving them, but having more witnesses was necessary. Our home had turned into a battleground. Just then, the front door burst open. It was my father, Alec. His footsteps echoed as he strode in. He marched straight to June. Dad! Alec's face was flushed with anger. June! How could you do this? What? This has nothing to do with you, Dad. Even now, you say that? I saw and heard you too with my own eyes and ears. I don't know what you're talking about. I was the one who took the photos. Leah came to me in tears, determined to fight. So, I followed your tracks. 
Using GPS to track their movements, I planned to get photographic evidence. But doubt crept in. Should I reveal the truth? Or should I pretend not to know and keep living as usual? When I was at a loss, I turned to Dad. Stubborn as he is, he listened empathetically. He faced the mistake his own daughter made. My father was incredibly reliable. And he offered to get the evidence himself. Don't you dare interfere! You two were talking loudly at the front door. I heard everything. Do you remember what you were talking about? I don't remember every little thing. June said she couldn't stand Leah being happy, that the man loved her more than Leah, and that she wanted to leave Leah to be with him. If you want to hear it again, I recorded it on my phone. Dad, usually silent, couldn't contain his anger. I wanted to be happy about having a grandchild. But when Leah told me the truth, I felt ashamed. Children don't choose their parents. When this child learns the truth, can you face them? Seeing my father plead, I almost cried for the first time today. I fought back the tears and turned to Rafe and June. His voice was steady but intense. Apologize now, June. It won't make things right, but do it sincerely. No. It's not my fault. June was panicking under my father's pressure. Tears streamed down her face, but I felt no sympathy. Rafe! Where do you think you're going? Travis caught Rafe trying to sneak out the door. How could you? How could you? Travis forced Rafe's head to the floor in a bow. Then my father-in-law bowed too. Leah. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. His voice trembled differently this time. Next to him, Jeannie was crying and bowing. Rafe had given up, no longer resisting. Travis, Jeannie, please stand up. Dad, calm down. You'll wake the baby. I took a deep breath and pulled out my final card from my bag. There's no repairing our marriage. Rafe, let's get a divorce. I handed the divorce papers to Rafe. Divorce? Yes. I can't trust you anymore. Divorce? That's too much. It was just a fling. Rafe's face was the most pathetic I had ever seen. A fling? Rafe, was I just a fling to you? I had a baby because of that fling. June, scolded by her dad and betrayed by Rafe, screamed with a face twisted with anger and sorrow. I don't know about any baby. How do you even know it's mine? It's definitely your baby. There's no one else. Both of them began to shed their pretenses, trying to escape the current pressure. Rafe, you've always said you wanted children, but now you reject the baby? That's... Rafe stammered. And June, why did you go after someone else's husband? As Dad said, I couldn't stand seeing you happy, Leah, June replied. Or maybe you were just desperate and the only one who showed interest was Rafe. Blaming me makes you feel less guilty, doesn't it? Just because you got married, you think you're so great, June retorted. June had always struggled with long-term relationships. It wouldn't be surprising if she felt an inferiority complex toward me. But that didn't excuse her actions. I've been betrayed for three years. I'm sorry, but I've made up my mind. I'm going back to my family home. That way, the baby and everything you wanted will be left here. Isn't this what you wanted? Leaving? Then who will do the housework? June will do it, of course. Right? Why should I do that? June snapped. Because that's what Rafe expects from a wife. In the end, neither of them changed their twisted personalities. In fact, it made it easier to leave them behind. 
Ignoring Rafe's pleas, I grabbed my packed belongings, and dad and I left the apartment. Rafe and June were left in a state of shock, and my in-laws bowed deeply without a word. The day after returning to my family home, my father started packing her remaining belongings. She needs to know there's no place for her here either, as dad said. He took the packed items to June's house. He seemed determined to give her a piece of his mind but returned sooner than expected. She wasn't home. What a waste of time. He said. Thank you. Let me make you some tea, I replied. I poured hot water from the electric kettle into a teapot. You must have hated seeing her. I said. A parent remains a parent no matter what their child does. He said, looking me in the eye. And you're my child too. Don't say such sentimental things at your age. I said, feeling embarrassed as I poured his tea. After stopping by June's house, he had also visited the apartment where I used to live. A day later, the scene was deserted, with no one around. That day, my father happened to run into a neighbor downstairs. The neighbor said that after dad and I left, they could still hear loud voices coming from our apartment. My in-laws had brought gifts of apology afterward. I truly felt indebted to them. The divorce with Rafe proceeded smoothly thanks to my in-laws' help. Though the thought of alimony crossed my mind, I doubted Rafe could pay it. I didn't want to burden my in-laws either. With no ties to bind him, Rafe's life unraveled. Before the divorce, I managed all the household finances. After the divorce, he was free to spend his income as he pleased, and it seemed he lacked self-control and was spending recklessly. He started going out drinking every night and came back to the apartment less frequently. He went to work still hungover, and since no one in the transportation industry can work effectively with a hangover, he was quickly fired. He tried to get another job, but he made the same drinking mistakes at a different transportation company. Lacking the skills for any other kind of work, he eventually couldn't pay the rent and was evicted from the apartment. Now, no one knows where he is or how he's living. As for June, Rafe's parents, concerned about the baby, offered to let her move in with them. It must have been a tough decision for my in-laws. From their perspective, she was the one who destroyed their son's family. Still, they extended their help, considering the baby's future, and I'm grateful for their kindness. However, their kindness did not reach June. Having nowhere else to go, June agreed to live with them at first. But after Rafe got fired, she started feeling uncomfortable and eventually left, abandoning the baby. The baby, on the other hand, is thriving under the care of Rafe's parents. Even after the divorce was finalized, I stayed in touch with Rafe's parents. I learned about Rafe and June's situation through them. Rafe and June took advantage of their parents' kindness and fled from their responsibilities. My contact with his parents is partly a way to make amends for my ex-husband and sister. The baby is innocent. Through a special adoption process, the baby legally became the child of Rafe's parents. Though I no longer have a legal connection to the baby, Rafe's parents always welcome me warmly. Now. I interact with them as friends rather than in-laws. Even though Rafe is gone, his parents continue to visit me just as often as they used to. Once you know the fun of the city, it's hard to quit," Jeannie said. Thank you for traveling such a long way. I'll make sure to give you the best hospitality while you're here," I replied. Though I felt bad about the long travel, I was grateful for their kindness. Someday, I'll have to tell the child the truth, but with understanding parents like them, I feel we can overcome it. Dad is still as quiet as ever, but he seems a bit softer than before. He even started helping take care of the baby. Whenever Rafe's parents visited and Jeannie and I were washing dishes, Dad would quietly approach the baby. Whenever Dad looked at the baby's face, he'd try to hide his delighted expression from me. 
One time, I noticed Dad changing the baby's diaper. I exclaimed in surprise. Dad, you're changing the diaper? I'm surprised, I exclaimed. What are you talking about? I've raised two kids. This is nothing, Alec retorted. Despite everything, it was Dad who was probably the happiest about June having a child. I never asked him directly, but I imagined him doing a victory dance in his mind, and I couldn't help but smile while watching him. I left my previous part-time job and started working as a caregiver at the facility where Mom resides. The work is tough, but I enjoy talking to Mom and many others there. All my past troubles haven't vanished completely. But still, I am happy now. I plan to find as much joy as possible in the future to make up for all the lost time. If you don't want kids, maybe I'll have them. Maybe I should just divorce and we have them. Suddenly, the word divorce popped up at an oddly serene dinner table. My heart skipped a beat and I inadvertently stopped what I was doing. But I quickly lifted my head and faced the two of them again. All right, we're getting a divorce, then. Huh? Despite being the ones to bring it up, both looked surprised at my response. Seeing their reaction, I immediately backtracked on the divorce talk. Ah, uh, right, of course. You're obviously joking. Osamand laughed, relieved. Next to him, Carly covered her mouth with her hand, chuckling along. But the truth is, I do want a divorce. However, I haven't gathered enough evidence yet. I'm far from ready to make a move. I want to set things straight with Osamand and others, but only when everything is in order. This conversation only made me more determined than before. Yeah, just kidding. I joined in on Osamand's laughter, making sure not to let on that I'm serious about wanting a divorce. My name is Lena. I'm 27. I used to work in an office at a design company, but after getting married, I quit my job to become a housewife. My husband's name is Osamand. We met at a party I was invited to by a friend. I've never been good at socializing. On days off, I'd stay in, and even on workdays, I'd skip out on drinking parties and outings, preferring to spend time alone. Because of that lifestyle, it's no surprise I hadn't had a boyfriend in a while. All my friends and juniors were either married or in relationships. It made me anxious whenever the topic of boyfriends or husbands came up. I felt the pressure to find someone soon when this opportunity came from a friend. My friend was surprised I took up the invitation. Wow, I invited you without expecting much. I know I'm the one that invited you, but did something happen? Nothing really. Just had a change of heart. I'm getting to that age where I should find a boyfriend and start thinking about the future. I shared my thoughts without holding anything back. Then, ah, uh, I see. You've had a change of heart. I'm glad I invited you. My friend said, laughing on the day of the party. I went to the bar which was the venue with my friend, and a few people were already there, chatting and having a good time. She easily joined the group, but I couldn't. Even as the party started, I couldn't manage to join in on the conversations and ended up drinking alone at the edge of the room. I wondered if it was impossible for someone like me to find a boyfriend. I stared at my nearly empty glass, lost in thought. The lively chatter from around me filled the air. My friend seemed to be enjoying the party, being at the center of the conversation. I envied those who could genuinely enjoy such gatherings. I wished I could be like that. As I looked at my watch thinking about leaving early, someone approached me. Hey, what's up? You look pretty lonely over here. Huh. A man started talking to me. That man would later become my husband, Osamand. Would you like to talk with me? Yes, I would. Osamand took a seat next to me, 
placing the drink he had been sipping on the table. We had introduced ourselves earlier, so we knew each other's names. So, you're Lena, right? Yes, and you're... Osamand. That's right. Thanks for remembering my name. Osamand thanked me, looking genuinely pleased. After that, we didn't join the rest of the group, opting instead to continue our conversation just between the two of us. We started with work, then moved on to hobbies, and even where we lived, the topics varied. Wow, really? Osaman seemed to pick up on my nervousness and made an effort to keep the conversation lively. Before I knew it, I was swept up in his enthusiasm, and my nervousness had vanished. Osamand was having fun talking, and he seemed genuinely interested in listening to me. Eventually, I found myself becoming fond of Osamand. I myself thought I was too easy. But for someone who doesn't usually talk to people, this was enough to make me take notice. After the party ended, we went to a bar to continue drinking, just the two of us. Alone with me, Osaman's demeanor changed completely from before, becoming more composed. Perhaps he had been playing up to the atmosphere before. Yet, his willingness to listen to me remained unchanged. Seeing this side of Osaman made my feelings for him grow. Today was fun. Thank you. Thank you as well. We hit it off so well that we exchanged our numbers and agreed to meet again. After that, we started seeing each other frequently. Could things really go this smoothly? The moment I decided to find a boyfriend, I was invited to a party and met someone compatible. I had expected more of a struggle, so I was a bit taken aback by how easily things were progressing. About two months after the party, Osamand confessed his feelings, and we started dating. He was just as kind to me as he had been before we were officially together. Whenever we both had time off, we would go on drives or trips, spending time together. That said, Osamand was busy with work. So our schedules didn't always match up, and we probably saw each other less often than other couples might. But we made up for it with phone calls and emails. I was satisfied with that. To say I wasn't lonely would be a lie. I wanted to see Osamand more, to be with Osamand more. Those feelings only grew stronger day by day. However, on the days we could meet, I was filled with happiness. Each time, I was reminded of how much I liked Osamand. Then one day, during our usual routine, Osamand suddenly introduced me to a woman. I want you to meet someone. Carly. She's an old friend of mine. Pleased to meet you. The woman introduced as Carly was Osamand's childhood friend. From what I heard, Osamand and Carly had been close since kindergarten, and they still visited each other's parents' homes and went out to eat together. Carly has always been such a great person. Oh, remember that time. Wait, why are you bringing that up now? I mean, it did happen, but... Osamand and Carly were completely engrossed in their own world, chatting away. Naturally, I had no idea how to navigate this situation. All I could do was watch them with a forced smile, feeling out of place. Noticing my discomfort, Osamand said. Ah, uh, I'm sorry. I figured you'd be seeing Carly around, so I thought I'd introduce you. Honestly, I wondered why I needed to get along with his childhood friend in the future. But I wasn't strong enough to voice such thoughts there and then. I just went along with it, trying not to upset Osamand and his friend. Oh, is that so? But you didn't know I was meeting with you today, right? Sorry if it feels like I just showed up out of the blue. Not at all. Please don't worry about it. I'm really glad to meet you. Really? Thank you. Carly smiled sweetly, thanking me. However, as time went on, Osamand and Carly continued to create their own little world, leaving me feeling left out. At first, 
I desperately tried to join in their conversation, but eventually, I realized it was futile and just sat there, sipping my coffee alone. If they were going to talk amongst themselves, I wondered why I was even needed there. I felt a mix of sadness and emptiness, silently observing them. The situation didn't change until two hours later when I finally managed to excuse myself from their company, after being treated like I wasn't there. I'm really sorry. It's been a while since I've seen Carly. I see. No, it's totally fine. It's good that you got to catch up after so long. Ah, uh, yeah. I'm really sorry. Osamand apologized, seeming genuinely remorseful. It appeared he was aware that he had done something wrong. I couldn't help feeling slightly angry that he had created this exclusive world with Carly in the first place. No, really, it's okay. I accepted Osamand's apology without holding any grudge. After that incident, Osamand never brought up Carly again. Perhaps he realized it was a sensitive issue. He started to check on my feelings more, likely thinking he had indeed made a mistake. At the time, I felt lonely and insecure, but deep down, I knew it wasn't something to make a big deal about. After all, they were childhood friends. It made sense that they'd get caught up in conversation after a long time apart. However, I couldn't bring myself to say I was okay with Carly. I didn't want to dredge up the topic myself. A few weeks after meeting Carly, Osaman's behavior returned to normal, and it felt like our daily life had resumed. A year later, Osaman proposed, and we got married. The wedding was attended by family, friends, colleagues, and Carly. Carly seemed genuinely happy for us. Congratulations on your wedding. I'm sure you know, but Osamand is really a great guy, and I believe you'll be very happy together. Thank you. Carly made a point to come over to me and speak. Her smile was a complex mix of happiness and loneliness. After the wedding, we returned to the new apartment we had rented as a married couple. Though we were already officially married and lived together, I remembered when we moved in and felt somewhat embarrassed. Osamand was right there beside me. Just the thought of being able to share the same space with him from now on filled my heart with joy. I couldn't help but smile at the thought of our future together. I wanted to spend forever with Osamand. However, this happy life did not last long. Even after marriage, Osamand was still busy with work but he made sure to spend as much time with me as possible. Except for when he had work dinners or special occasions, he would always come home before the date changed, and despite being tired himself, he would offer kind words to me as I did the housework. He was with me all weekend, taking me on trips and shopping. It might have seemed ordinary, but I felt truly happy with just that. But then, suddenly, a certain person started to intrude on our lives, significantly changing our routine. It was during a weekend shopping trip in town with Osamand. I spotted a familiar figure. It was Carly. She had seen us too and hurried over with a happy expression. Hey, Osamand, Lena. Carly. What a coincidence. As I was about to greet her, Osamand casually reached out and tousled Carly's hair. Hey, Osamand. You're messing up my hair. Ah, uh, sorry, sorry. I just can't help it when I see you. I understood that they were close, but seeing them like this pained my heart. Osamand didn't seem to think it was a big deal, and Carly didn't seem to mind. They started talking without paying any attention to me, reigniting a sense of emptiness within me. I didn't know what to do, so I just looked at nearby products and thought vaguely about where to go next. Despite being able to see me, Carly continued to talk to Osamand without any concern. The conversation lasted about 10 minutes before ending. Sorry. I didn't realize you two were on a date today. My bad. 
It's fine. Right, Lena? Yeah, it's fine. Unable to deny it, I pretended not to mind. Since that day, Carly began to appear more frequently wherever Osamand and I went out together. I thought it was a coincidence the first two times, but after it kept happening, I couldn't help but think they were arranging it behind my back. Whenever they met, they acted as if it were a chance encounter. Wow! What a coincidence! That became their routine phrase. Once, I gathered the courage to ask. Um. Are you two in touch? Seeing each other so often when we're out, it seems unlikely to be just coincidence. However, they wouldn't admit it. No, it's just a coincidence. Right, Carly? Yeah. Just a coincidence. Happen to be, right? They laughed it off together. But their expressions seemed almost mocking. They would hold hands or touch each other's cheeks every time they met. Their level of physical affection seemed excessive. Despite being told they had always been this way claiming it was normal for childhood friends, something about it didn't sit right with me. Ah, uh, wait, should we stop holding hands? Lena looks mad. Ah, uh, sorry, Lena. But Carly is really just an old friend. There's absolutely nothing weird between us, so don't worry, okay? Hey, what's that supposed to mean? Well, it's not like I like you or anything. After Carly's comment, Osamand cheerfully placed his hand on her head again. Despite my anger, Osamand continued his physical affection with Carly. Carly didn't seem to mind at all. Is it normal for childhood friends to be this close? Watching Osamand and Carly, my distrust grew day by day. After several similar incidents, I mustered up the courage to speak to Osamand. Um, Osamand. What's up? Osamand looked at me with his usual kind smile. Um, about Carly. I know she's your childhood friend, and I understand you're close, but could you maybe reduce the physical affection a bit? Reduce it! Yeah, since we're married. Osaman's face turned serious for a moment before he relaxed again. That brief serious expression scared me, making me regret bringing it up. Ah, uh, sorry. Was it bothering you? A little. Normally, Osamand would laugh it off and agree. But he was different that day. But you know, Carly and I are just childhood friends, right? There's really nothing to worry about. What does that mean? Just don't think too much about it. Consider it part of our communication. Okay. With a troubled smile, he walked away from me. Seeing this, I couldn't help but feel anxious, regretting my question and wondering if I had made an unreasonable request or upset Osamand. At the same time, I questioned if I was wrong. As his wife, I wanted him to limit his physical contact with Carly, even though they were childhood friends. Nonetheless, life with Osamand continued uneasily. A month after my request, nothing had changed. In fact, it seemed to get worse. Carly started to intrude on our home. She would come over on weekdays and weekends, eat, and then leave. With me preparing everything, Carly would just show up suddenly, spending time talking to Osamand on the sofa. Even when I asked for help with carrying things. You can handle that much on your own, right? Yeah! She would dismiss my request. By this time, Osamand had completely taken Carly's side. He hardly listened to me and always spoke in Carly's favor when I objected. Seriously. Lena can't do anything by herself. Hey, don't say that in front of her, that's the worst. They laughed at me as if I were a joke. Naturally, I didn't feel good about it. Whenever I returned to the kitchen without saying anything, I would end up being criticized. Eh, is she sulking? Over just this? 
Come on, that's a bit much, isn't it? I continued preparing the meal, trying to ignore their voices. It seemed only fair that she help with preparations since she came over uninvited. Yet, why should I be the one to face complaints? Moreover, being accused of sulking or being incapable of doing anything alone was incredibly rude. Carly came over several times a week. And she always made sure to have a meal before leaving. Even during meals, there was no sense of calm. Carly would sit next to Osamand, constantly pestering him. Osamand seemed to not mind her actions. They would feed each other or share laughs, looking entirely like a couple to anyone observing. But it turns out Carly actually had a fiancé. Named Raymond. He worked at the same company as Carly, holding a rather prestigious position. Though I heard he was abroad currently. Still, I thought it inappropriate for someone engaged to engage in such excessive physical intimacy with their childhood friend. Carly, could you maybe stop coming over so often? The food costs are adding up, and it's more work to cook. However, Osaman just laughed off my request. Come on. Carly's single right now, and she says it's lonely going home to an empty house. Maybe we should be a bit more understanding. But... It's fine, really. Osaman didn't seem inclined to criticize Carly at all. In fact, he seemed happier with her than with me. I wondered why Osamand couldn't show me the same smile. Eventually, I began to despise not only Carly but also the sight of Osamand smiling at her. A year into our marriage, Carly's intrusions continued unabated. By this time, I had given up, no longer complaining and simply catering to Carly. Maybe this was the arrangement Osamand and Carly desired. Their physical intimacy intensified, and they appeared even happier than before. I dreaded that this lifestyle would persist until Carly got married. The thought filled me with gloom. Divorce. The words started to cross my mind occasionally. Yet, I found it hard to take any action. Time kept moving forward. But one day, a comment from Carly prompted me to decide on divorce. Hey, aren't you two planning to have kids? What? Her tactless remark made me exclaim in surprise. Osamand and I had decided not to have children yet. And we might never do so. That's what I thought I had said, but... Ah, uh, Lena's just really against it. What? I never said that. I hadn't said anything of the sort. Osamand was trying to look good in front of Carly. I glared and contradicted him. Really, Lena? It's been about a year since you got married, right? Why would you be against it? No, I never said I was against. But Carly wasn't listening at all. Didn't Osamand like kids? Lena, isn't it selfish to say no? I'm not being selfish. I never said that. It's a real concern. Osamand continued to take Carly's side, even in this situation, choosing his childhood friend over his wife. It made me realize for the first time that perhaps I couldn't continue going on with him. Then Carly said something outrageous, pushing me further. If you don't want kids, maybe I'll have them. Maybe I should just divorce and we have them. Osaman joined in with her laughter, not rebuking Carly's words. The casual mention of divorce shocked me, my heart raced, and I stopped what I was doing. Divorce. There are jokes that can be made and ones that shouldn't be. The inability to distinguish between the two was exasperating. However, I quickly faced them again. All right. We're getting a divorce, then. Huh? They were surprised, even though they brought it up. I quickly corrected the notion of divorce. Just kidding. Maybe it's time we started thinking about kids. Ah, uh, right, of course. You're obviously joking. Osamand laughed, relieved. 
while Carly covered her mouth beside him, smiling joyously. Such a happy occasion. But the truth was, I did want a divorce. Despite joking about it, I couldn't shake the thought. I'll really get a divorce. Annoyingly, Carly's remark made me decide to divorce Osamand. Yet, it was too early to act. Yeah, just kidding. While formulating a plan in my head, I responded to Osamand. From observing Osamand and Carly up close, I suspected they might be having an affair. If that was the case, my options were limited. After much thought, I decided to hire a detective to gather evidence of the affair. I also tried to sneak a peek at Osaman's mobile phone to gather evidence myself. If they weren't cheating, I'd think of something else. But there was no need. When I checked Osaman's unlocked phone, there was an abundance of exchanges with Carly. The content was damning. From sweet conversations akin to those of lovers to suggestive messages and photos from hotel visits. There was more than enough to call it evidence. Considering Osamand didn't lock his phone, he seemed utterly careless. Further investigation by the detective confirmed they met frequently. Mostly at hotels. The dates they met matched the days Osamand told me he'd be home late. He had lied about overtime and drinking parties to meet Carly. Even though I had a vague idea they were cheating, seeing concrete evidence made me feel indescribable. Meanwhile, Osamand and Carly's behavior didn't change. Carly kept coming over, eating, teasing me, and having fun. Unaware of what I was doing behind the scenes, their carefree actions seemed almost ludicrous. About a month after I started gathering evidence, Osamand invited me to an event. There's an engagement party for Carly next month. Engagement party? Yeah, you know Carly's fiancé is pretty high up, right? So, they need to have a sort of introduction party for the marriage. So, her partner is coming back? Yeah, I think he might already be back. The engagement party was irrelevant to me. The nerve of having such a party while engaging in an affair baffled me. I see. You've been invited? You should go. I said dismissively, somewhat irritated by Osaman's nonchalant laughter. But his response was unexpected. What are you talking about? You're coming with me. Me? With you? Why? Because you've always been so helpful to Carly. Oh, I see. She wants me there because I was helpful. Did they really invite me for that reason? My heart, already jaded, doubted even the reason for my invitation. But it would be rude to decline if I was invited. I thought you might not like parties. Can you manage? No, I'll go. She invited me, after all. Osaman's face brightened at my words. Great. I'll let Carly know. He seemed pleased as he went to his room with his phone, likely to contact Carly. In truth, I didn't want to go. The last thing I wanted was to see Carly happy. Why should I put myself in such a situation? However, as I prepared, an idea struck me. This plan could significantly change my current predicament. If so, using the party to my advantage was too good an opportunity to miss. What I'm about to do is low as a person. But I had been tormented by Osamand and Carly far more. A little revenge seemed justified. I prepared for the party and my plan of retaliation simultaneously. A month later, the day of the party arrived. Dressed appropriately, Osamand and I headed to the venue. Entering the venue. The opulence of chandeliers, carpets, and tables made me hesitate. The old Osamand would have reassured me here, but now he was busy scanning the room for someone. The guests all seemed important, making me feel out of place. Then, someone called out. Ah, Osamand! You made it! 
Turning toward the voice, I saw Carly. Accompanied by a fresh-faced young man and a kindly-looking elderly couple. Apparently, the young man was Carly's fiancé, Raymond. And the elderly couple were her parents. Congratulations, Carly! Thank you! And to you too, and Raymond too! Congratulations! Thank you for your kind words. Osamand was unusually polite. A side of him I might have never seen before. Afterward, the party officially began with an announcement. After getting my meal, I returned to my seat to find Osamand and Carly's parents engaged in a lively conversation. Osamand, you and Carly are childhood friends, right? What was she like back then? Carly back then? Hey, that's kind of embarrassing. Osamand, unfazed by Carly's embarrassment, shared stories of her past. She liked catching bugs and racing. We used to play tag a lot. You're really going to tell that story? Carly squirmed, visibly embarrassed. But not entirely displeased. You two really are close. Watching you, it's like your real siblings. I knew it was impolite, but I couldn't let myself be swept along if I wanted to execute my plan. I apologized internally as I interjected. Osaman seemed surprised by my interruption. Eyes wide. Really? What's it like when Carly is with Osamand? They're very close. How should I put it? They're like lovers. Hey, Lena! Osaman tried to stop me, but I continued. Carly often comes over for meals. She talks with Osaman the whole time I'm preparing food, looking very happy. During meals, they feed each other, hold hands. They're really close. Hey, what are you? I could feel the atmosphere freeze with my words. Carly's parents and Raymond looked at Osamand and Carly as if they couldn't believe what they were hearing. Feed each other? Yes. Oh, I don't have photos of them feeding each other, but I do have pictures of them looking very close and their exchanges. Would you like to see? Hey! Lena! Before Osamand could stop me, I opened my mobile phone to show the evidence gathered by the detective and myself. Raymond's face paled significantly upon seeing it. Lena! Don't say weird things! Weird? I'm just sharing the truth. This is how you two usually are. Osamand bit his lip, unable to say anything, his expression sour. But Carly lashed out at me. I felt vindicated. I had never seen Osamand and Carly look so frustrated. Deciding to go through with my revenge felt right. Lena! Stop being freaky! And why do you have these photos? You shouldn't know about this. What, did you hire a detective? Unbelievable! Yes, I hired a detective. Why? Osamand was taken aback, realizing his actions with Carly, which went beyond mere childhood friendship, had been exposed. Wanna know why? I pulled out a completed divorce application from my bag and slammed it in front of Osamand. Let's get divorced. I can't take it anymore. There's no need to say that here. Ever since we got married, Carly has been a constant presence in my life. We ran into her whenever we went out, and despite asking you to keep distance, she came over for dinner multiple times. And to top it off, you lied about working late to meet her at hotels. What's the point of being married then? I let it all out. Osaman's loud response had drawn the attention of everyone in the venue. I know it was wrong, but... If you knew it was wrong, why didn't you stop? Didn't I ask you to stop repeatedly? Well, yes, but... You don't really think it was wrong, do you? If you did, you wouldn't make excuses, you'd apologize. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry. 
As Osamand and I argued, Carly attempted to intervene. Hey, stop arguing here. Raymond, Mom, Dad, help. However, the three of them did not take Carly's side. Carly, those photos are real, aren't they? What? I'm asking if they're real. Not that you'd admit to cheating on your own. Raymond looked profoundly disheartened. Understandably so. He must have been thinking of his fiancée Carly while working abroad. Only to find her cheating with her childhood friend. With so much evidence, I can't marry you. I was a fool to trust you. Wait. That's not true. They're all lies. Lies? So, you're saying Lena fabricated all this just to trap you and Osamand? Yes, that's right. What? I couldn't hold back anymore. Was she not satisfied after manipulating me all this much? Still trying to control the narrative? Even now, Carly wouldn't admit to the affair, which infuriated me further, and I couldn't help but shout. Who would do such a thing for you? I don't have the time for that. If I were to spend my time on you, I'd rather find a new hobby. What did you say? Carly snapped back at my words. However, it was Carly's parents who stopped her. Carly! Enough! Aren't you ashamed of yourself for doing such things? Dad. I never thought you would do something like this. Sure, you and Osaman were close, but I never imagined it would lead to this. It's truly shameful. What? Don't say it's shameful. It is embarrassing. Raymond, I'm so sorry. It's understandable that you can't marry her now, and we won't mind if you call off the engagement. I too must apologize. I'm truly, truly sorry. Watching her parents apologize to Raymond, Carly seemed to realize the irreparable mistake she had made. Tears streaming, she pleaded with Raymond. I'm sorry. Please, don't call off the engagement. I've had enough of you. I can't marry you. No. Osamand, witnessing Carly's situation, also begged for my forgiveness. Lena, I'm really sorry. I'll never cheat again. Please, let's not divorce. But I couldn't possibly trust Osaman's words. Never cheat again? Unbelievable. I'm divorcing you. And I'll be claiming compensation too. Looks like your beloved Carly is getting dumped too, so you two might as well stay together. No, wait, think this over. Absolutely not. I can't live with someone like you any longer. I grabbed the divorce papers again and pushed them toward Osamand. There's no way we can rebuild from this. If you understand, agree to the divorce now. Realizing I was serious, Osamand no longer resisted and agreed to the divorce. Finally, I could get away from this man. And I wouldn't have to see Carly's face anymore. This realization brought a smile to my face. A few days later, Osamand and I were officially divorced. I managed to claim compensation from both Osamand and Carly, which was satisfying. Carly and Raymond officially ended their engagement too. Despite the scandal, neither Osamand nor Carly quit their jobs. I thought they might leave their positions due to the divorce and scandal spreading through their companies. However, it seems they couldn't afford to quit, needing to pay the compensation. In a way, that served them right. Thinking so might mean I have a bad personality too. After the divorce was finalized, I apologized to Raymond for ruining the party. But he kindly said, No worries. Thank you for letting me know about Carly's affair. It was a big help. A year after divorcing Osamand, I'm living comfortably alone, 
working a new job in a new city. I'm not sure what Osamand and Carly are up to, but the compensation is being deposited monthly, so they must be managing somehow. It seems I'm better off living alone than with someone. I probably won't marry again. I cherish these happy days and plan to continue enjoying my favorite tea alone. You're the reason mom took her own life. I want a divorce right now. I was dumbfounded when I suddenly received an angry call from my husband while having lunch outside. Actually, I'm having lunch with your mother right now? What? My husband said so and immediately hung up. Puzzled about why he said such a thing, I tilted my head in confusion along with my mother-in-law. However, after learning his motives, I decided to stand up and thoroughly confront him. My name is Mary, and I'm 28 years old. I've been married to my husband Daniel, who's two years my senior, for three years now. While supporting my husband who works as a company president, I also started working from home to help with the household finances. But it seems Daniel wasn't too happy about me working. You don't need to work, you know. That wasn't a word of appreciation for me trying to balance housework and a job. It'll look like I'm not earning enough if my wife has to work. I was disappointed with my husband who cared only about his own appearance. But to that, I was often uplifted by my mother-in-law, Susan. It's commendable that you're working from home on your own terms. And, she often invited me out for lunch. I loved Susan, and despite how I felt about my husband, I was content with my life. Maybe I've been too lenient with Daniel. One day, while chatting in a cafe with Susan, she sighed. I spoiled him as an only child, but lately, he's been asking for money frequently, he says it's for the company, but it seems suspicious. I had no idea, Daniel never mentioned anything like that to me. But knowing my husband who likes to show off, even if the company was in trouble, he probably wouldn't tell me until it was too late. I sometimes regret how I raised my child. I worry if I've been a burden to you, Mary, and it keeps me up at night. Susan, you've done nothing wrong. No matter how hard you try in parenting, it ultimately depends on the child. I might not be convincing since I don't have any kids, but... No, Mary, I feel so relieved that you're trying to cheer me up. Thank you, as always. Seeing Susan's gentle smile, I strongly felt that no matter what happens, I'll always stand by her side. Perhaps disliking my connection with Susan, my husband gradually started to harass me more. What's with today's lunch? Strawberry jam on a sandwich? What? Isn't it your favorite? I only accept blueberry jam. Strawberry is too common and poor looking for my taste. Daniel came home, yelling, and threw the lunchbox into the trash can. How could you? That lunchbox is getting old too. Buy a new one, will you? As he stomped into his room, a sweet perfume scent wafted from him. Daniel, you've been wearing that scent a lot lately. However, when I cleaned his room, there was no perfume bottle, and I suspected it might be a woman's fragrance. And then, without any notice, he started coming home late more frequently. Hey, I put extra effort into dinner today and waited for you, didn't you get my message? Yeah, I know. But no matter how hard you try, your cooking can't beat a one-star hotel's. What? Did you eat out on purpose? Daniel, you've been acting strange lately. What? Shut up. Move, you're in the way. He shouted, pushing me aside and walking to the bathroom. That's when I caught that perfume scent again. I don't want to think about it but it's clearly a sign of cheating. I was restless, and soon Daniel even started badmouthing Susan. That old lady, she should just give me the money without lecturing. Acting all high and mighty. Look who's talking. How can you ask Susan for money? That's none of your business. He seemed irritated and kicked the trash can to intimidate me. And usually, wives and mother-in-laws don't get along. It's not supposed to be that way. But Susan is such a good person. 
I have no reason to dislike her. My husband clicked his tongue in annoyance at my response. Then, Daniel started badgering me about Susan. Mom was complaining about you again. Says she hates going out with you because you're an inconsiderate daughter-in-law. No way! Susan would never say that. Considering my relationship with Susan so far, I couldn't believe Daniel's words. You really are naive. Why would she reveal her true feelings to a daughter-in-law like you? She's just been tolerating you. Watching my husband's exasperated expression, I began to worry if it might be true. Moreover, he told me Susan didn't want to see me and asked me not to contact her. I intended to trust Susan, but I thought it best to lay low for a while. Oh, right. Mom asked me to give you something. What is it? But when I looked inside the box Daniel handed me, it was rotten and emitted a terrible smell. I grimaced. The expiration date on the back was a month old. They were perishables. Wow, this is bad. Mom really hates you, doesn't she? My husband looked maliciously pleased. During this time, the perfume scent only grew stronger, and I endured a hellish three months. One day, unable to bear it anymore, I decided to call Susan. Tomorrow, I'll finish work by noon. Would you like to meet up? I'd like to have lunch and talk a bit. Yes, that's fine, but are you sure you want to see me? What do you mean? I only understood the meaning behind Susan's words when we met the next day in a private room at a restaurant. It turns out my husband had also lied to Susan, telling her I'd been speaking ill of her. Of course, the story about Susan complaining about me was also a lie by my husband. I thought so too. But I was worried, maybe it was true. These past three months have felt like I was dead inside. I also thought there's no way you would say such things, but just in case it was true, I was avoiding going out with you. So what's with the rotten perishables? What? What are you talking about? Seeing Susan tilt her head in confusion, I realized that was also a lie by Daniel. While Susan and I, feeling distrustful towards Daniel, were discussing our next steps over lunch, my phone rang. Huh? It's Daniel. I excused myself to Susan and answered the call, only to be yelled at by my husband. It's your fault! What? Why are you yelling at me all of a sudden? You bullied mom into taking her own life. I want a divorce from you right now. Confused by Daniel's words, I was stunned. Actually, I'm having lunch with your mother right now? What? Surprised, my husband immediately hung up. What was that about? What happened? Before we could even ponder, Susan received a call. Hello? Oh, Daniel? What's up? Susan quickly switched her phone to speaker mode. On the other end, my husband's voice lowered, as if he was trying to find out something. Mom. Are you with someone right now? To that Susan winked at me and responded. Oh, I'm just out shopping with a friend. Is something wrong? Hearing this, my husband muttered. She lied, that liar. Then, he blurted out something outrageous. Mary is cheating. You know what? I'm divorcing her, so you must never trust her again. What? I gestured to Susan to keep talking. Quietly nodding, she pretended to be fooled and continued to draw out my husband's motives. Finally, the reason behind Daniel's suspicious behavior became clear. After ending the call with my husband, Susan's face looked devilish. I was filled with anger too. Susan, let's teach that man a lesson together. When I got home, my husband was already there. Oh, you're home early today. Yeah. Despite his inner tension, Daniel's attempt to appear calm was almost comical. But I decided to take the initiative. Today, I got a weird call around noon. It might be my imagination, but the voice sounded like yours. Is it some new scam or something? What? Really? Be careful not to get fooled, okay? Hearing my words, my husband seemed relieved, thinking he'd gotten away with it, and reverted to his usual demeanor. 
where were you anyways? If you're a housewife, you should act like one and stick to house chores. Okay, I hear you. Then the doorbell rang. I'm doing the dishes, could you get the door, Daniel? Fine. Reluctantly, he opened the door and I heard him scream. Standing there was Susan and another young woman. Emily! What are you doing here? Oh, I just invited your new bride over as a mother. She's young and cute, isn't she? Mom, don't say anything. Daniel gestured for Susan to be quiet, but I watched from behind with a cold gaze. I'm sorry to say this, but both Susan and I know about your affair. I watched Daniel gasp. Please, come in. He welcomed the woman named Emily. How long have you known? Sitting across from us, Daniel looked up with a fearful gaze. Daniel, every time you came home, you smelled of perfume. Didn't you notice? Or is there something wrong with your nose? Tired of feeling uneasy, I decided to investigate my husband's mistress. Disguising my hair and outfit, I frequented a cafe near his office and followed him and his mistress to a hotel, capturing the moment they entered. I was so excited that I couldn't sleep that night. How did you find her contact information? You thought you were careful by setting your phone's lock to fingerprint recognition, but that's easy to bypass when you're asleep. Don't I have any privacy? Be quiet! Susan, usually calm and gentle, raised her voice, silencing her son. So, I contacted Emily, and Susan went to pick her up. I forced my husband's chin up as he sat with his head down. He couldn't move, just looking into my eyes. You mentioned your intentions over the phone to Susan, but could you share them with me too? I intended to smile, but perhaps my eyes weren't smiling, as my husband trembled. Reluctantly, he began to explain his suspicious behavior and the purpose of his call that day. I plan to divorce you, take the alimony and shared property, and then remarry Emily. So, initially, you intended to make it look like Susan took her own life and blame me for it, leading to a divorce. Is that correct? He nodded in small movements. It's surprising he thought such a lie about Susan's death would work. I guess he was that into his mistress. But when I told him I was having lunch with Susan, he was so caught off guard that he hung up the phone in shock. Still unrepentant, my husband, thinking of his next move, quickly contacted Susan. When Daniel came to me with his plan, I was utterly disappointed. Susan pretended to be deceived and extracted the story from him. Mary cheated, so I'll take the compensation money and the shared property. That's what he told Susan. And he added the following. I've already found a new partner to marry as soon as we divorce. That partner turned out to be Emily, now sitting in front of us, pale-faced. Why won't you take my side? What do you mean? You always supported me. In elementary school, you always defended me when I did something wrong. But you changed ever since I married Mary. How far back are you living in the past? And I regret spoiling you too much when you were young. Daniel thought that his mother had changed because of me and had been lying to both of us so we wouldn't see each other. Disappointed with her son, Susan sighed deeply. I never thought you could be so selfish. I'll end it here. I'm cutting off your financial support. What? You're kidding, right? Actually, Susan had been financially supporting Daniel's company and his success as a president was largely due to her. However, after becoming suspicious of his constant requests for money, Susan discovered he was using the funds for his mistress and not the company. I no longer consider you my son. I'm disowning you, so leave this house. Daniel's face turned increasingly pale. It was only natural, since the house we lived in was in Susan's name, and he had always relied on his mother. Seeing him look at me in panic, I pushed the divorce papers towards him. Sign here, please. Here's a pen. Enjoy your life with your mistress as much as you want. At least let me off the compensation money. Don't joke with me. How dare you claim Susan took her own life? I said so and slapped his face. What? 
If there's no money, there's no benefit to marrying an old man like you. The mistress said so and slapped his face too. Daniel, holding his face, teared up and collapsed on the floor. By the way, Emily. I'll be seeking compensation from you too. What? Why me? You can't just meddle with someone's husband and get away scot-free. But. She too slumped powerlessly to the floor, and together, Susan and I kicked both the Daniel and Emily out into the cold. After divorcing my husband, I demanded $20,000 in compensation. He was kicked out of the house owned by Susan, his financial support was cut off, and his company went bankrupt. Now homeless and penniless, Daniel is apparently living on the streets. Of course, I also got $10,000 in compensation from the mistress. Susan and I remain close, and after my divorce, I moved in with her. Our bond deepened even more. And we now live freely and happily together, just the two of us. I will be erased soon. A letter from my sister-in-law Elizabeth, who had taken her own life, arrived addressed to me. It came a week after she had passed to the other side. Despite her will already being found, what on earth was going on? I couldn't understand at all. But when I saw that letter, my hands started shaking with anger. This can't be forgiven. The letter ended with the words, report to police immediately. Little did I know what would happen next. My name is Jessica, I'm 28 years old. I live with my husband Paul, who is five years older than me. Both of us worked at different companies. Paul had a sister named Elizabeth, a very gentle person who and for me who had no sisters, was like a real sister. And Elizabeth treated me like a sister as well. My sister-in-law was unmarried and said she had no boyfriend, but she confided in me alone. Actually, there's someone I've been interested in lately. He's a wrestler and is very strong," Elizabeth said with a happy smile. And this was a secret kept between just us. My father-in-law was a practicing doctor, but passed away due to illness three months ago, and after that, Elizabeth started living with my mother-in-law. But then, my mother-in-law also passed to the other side. The cause was due to an overdose of medication. Likely obtained from my father-in-law's clinic. After my father-in-law passed away, they were considering closing the clinic since my parents-in-law were known as a loving couple to everyone. The will created on the computer mentioned my mother-in-law couldn't bear my father-in-law's death. But my mother-in-law was a person who always enjoyed writing and had a beautiful handwriting as well. So I felt it was odd that her last message to this world wasn't handwritten. But my husband simply accepted it. She chose to go to the other side so it's not strange she did something different. She must have been that lonely. Indeed, thinking of my mother-in-law's immense sorrow for the love of my father-in-law, I oddly found myself agreeing with Paul. But, amidst such interference, there was a mountain of things left to do. Because my mother-in-law had hardly touched anything inherited from my father-in-law, she had left behind a vast fortune. Paul would find time to immerse himself in the inheritance procedures. In contrast, my sister-in-law began sorting through my mother-in-law's belongings, one by one. And from this time, I started to notice a change in Paul's behavior. When he's home, he would stay in his room and when he had work, he would come home late. And then finally, he started frequently coming home in the morning without telling me at all. You've been acting strange lately. What on earth are you doing? It's none of your business. But. Your mother just passed away, and you're not coming home until morning. Shut up! Don't preach to me! My husband stormed out the door and became unreachable, not returning until the next evening. Given the gravity of our marital crisis, I confided in my sister-in-law about the situation with him. I'll subtly ask Paul what's been happening. Let's work together and resolve this. Her encouragement somehow bolstered my spirits. Yet, what followed was unimaginable. The very next day, my sister-in-law suddenly left this world. The cause was the same as my mother-in-law's, an overdose. And she too had left a note. I will join my beloved mother on her journey. But the idea that Elizabeth, 
who had been so positive just days before, taking her own life made no sense to me. Something is definitely wrong. Let's get the police to investigate. Making a fuss won't bring Elizabeth back. You just do what you're supposed to do quietly. Despite my inability to accept, the funeral wouldn't wait. With a heart full of sorrow and unresolved feelings, I proceeded to make the arrangements. After Elizabeth's funeral, exactly one week later, I was set to return to work. Arriving at the office, there was an envelope on my desk. It seemed to have arrived while I was away. Who could it be from? What? This can't be. I was shocked to see the sender's name. It was a letter from Elizabeth, who had passed away. Panicked, I opened it. I will be erased soon. Report to the police immediately. This sentence caught my eye. And as I continued to read, my hands began to tremble. The hidden truth. I can't believe this. Gradually, I felt a strong anger building inside me, my head heating up. Reflecting on everything that had happened, I resolved to put an end to it myself. But, I still lacked the crucial piece to do so. Thus, I sent a letter to someone, quietly waiting for the right time. Two nights later, I visited my parents-in-law's home and hid myself. Then, a dark figure quietly entered my sister-in-law's room. I followed the dark figure and then turned on the light. It's so bright! The person rummaging through Elizabeth's desk was none other than my husband, Paul. What are you doing here? And in the dark, too. It's as if you're searching for something, hoping not to be found. Don't say something stupid. What are you doing here yourself? As if I was the one doing something wrong, he pointed his finger at me. Ignoring my husband, I pulled out something I had prepared from my bag. Did you happen to read this letter? It was a letter I had written, pretending to be my sister-in-law, addressed to myself to arrive at our house. It read, Inside my desk, there is evidence of my brother's crime. Jessica, take this and report to the police. I had anticipated my quick-thinking husband would guess a letter from my sister-in-law contained something serious and would read it without permission. Seeing this, you came to destroy the evidence, but unfortunately, what's written here was a fake I created to lure you in. What are you talking about? I was just cleaning up. Really? Then can you say the same after seeing this? I took out the letter I had received from my sister-in-law a few days ago. Elizabeth knew you were responsible for sending your mother to the other side. That's why she pressured you to turn yourself in, right? But you took care of her too. Hearing these words, my husband instantly turned his face away. I pressed on, presenting the content of the letter to Paul. While sorting through things, Elizabeth found your mother's diary. It seems to say you jumped on some shady investment. So what? That's something I have no recollection of. Lies. It's all written here. I took out the diary my sister-in-law had enclosed in the letter. According to it, Paul had been pestering her to invest the family's fortune. Despite her refusals, he was persistent, causing her great distress. Unable to confide in anyone, my mother-in-law poured her anguished heart into the diary. Look here. As long as I'm in my right mind, I'll never let the fortune my husband left to be used for such dubious purposes. I want to live long for the both of us. It says so, right? So what if it does? The evidence here made Elizabeth realize you must have been the one to end your mother's life. However, no matter how much my Elizabeth searched, she couldn't find definitive proof you sent my mother-in-law to the other side. As a last resort, Elizabeth tried to get a confession out of Paul. But my sister-in-law thought, being capable of such acts towards his own mother, he might not spare her either. If anything happened to her, she entrusted me through the letter to report my husband to the police. Hey, all of that is just made-up stories. After all, there's no conclusive evidence I sent those two to the other side, is there? You rummaging through Elizabeth's belongings right now is evidence enough. Calm down, will you? Saying this, my husband left the room and returned with coffee he had brewed in the kitchen. 
Here, drink this and calm down. Paul offered the coffee with a nonchalant demeanor. But this was exactly my aim. Surely you've mixed something strange in large amounts in this. Indeed, no decisive evidence of his crimes was found as my husband said. However, it was almost certain Paul was responsible for their deaths. And the deciding factor for my mother-in-law and sister-in-law's journey to the other side was medication. I figured if I made enough noise, you'd surely try to do the same to me too. If you handed me a drink or something, I thought it would surely contain something suspicious, becoming irrefutable evidence. My husband, clearly unsettled by my deductions, clicked his tongue. Basically, you jumped at that get-rich-quick scheme because you were squandering money on a woman, right? I had long suspected our marriage had grown cold and wondered if Paul was having an affair. Since a lot had been going on regarding my mother-in-law and sister-in-law, I had left it alone, but now I decided to thoroughly investigate Paul's background. Then, I found an unknown credit card in his room and discovered a history of purchases of expensive women's brand items on the statement. And, I found this as well. I pulled out a club hostess's business card I found in the inner pocket of his suit. I went to the club and met the woman named on this card. What? You met Nancy? Since she wasn't looking for any trouble, she told me everything just like that. She said you two were already in a relationship. According to Nancy, Paul was the one who persistently approached her. However, for her, Paul was just a good target, entering into the relationship only to get money from him. Knowing Paul was married, Nancy demanded compensation from him, which he complied with. But, she's been feeling bothered by you for a while. She said she was going to change clubs to cut ties with you. Too bad. What? but, I spent so much on her. Tears welled up in Paul's eyes as he hung his head. Paul infatuated with another woman was now depressed because his affair partner dumped him. How dare you act like this in front of your wife? I couldn't help but feel another wave of anger. Then suddenly, Paul lunged at me. Give me the coffee. He tried to snatch the coffee, which likely contained a large amount of medication and could serve as evidence of his crime. Stop it. Let go. Just give it to me. I struggled fiercely, but the difference in strength meant it was only a matter of time before the evidence ended up in his hands. But then, someone intervened to help. Get your hands off her. Easily knocking Paul down and pinning him to the floor. Who on earth are you? He's Richard, the man Elizabeth loved. He worked at the same place as my sister-in-law and had attended Elizabeth's funeral. Before Elizabeth passed away, she had mentioned about Richard. There's a wonderful man with a wrestling background. Seeing Richard, a solidly built man, holding back tears in front of Elizabeth lying in peace, I instantly knew he was the man my sister-in-law had loved. Approaching him, he opened up about his feelings for Elizabeth. Richard, too, couldn't believe my sister-in-law had taken her own life and we exchanged contact information, promising to share any new information. In order to carry out this plan, I had asked him to hide just in case. Damn it! You tricked me! My husband struggled, and with my help, the two of us managed to subdue him. Thinking he couldn't escape, Paul suddenly changed his tune. Look, Richard, can't we talk this out? If you let me go now, I might even share a bit of my family's wealth with you. You open your mouth and that's what you suggest? Jessica, you too. You know your husband could be criticized by society. Appalling. Did you really think I'd stay by your side for life? You really are full of yourself. You and I are over. When I mentioned breaking up, my husband's face turned pale. What? I'm going to be abandoned by my wife and get locked up? No, no, I don't want that. Paul struggled fiercely again, but Richard restrained him. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Never. You took the lives of your own mother and sister. Thinking of the two who had gone to heaven, I couldn't let Paul get away with this. I clenched my fists and glared at my husband. You're the worst kind of human being. 
I will never forgive you, Paul. Serve your time quietly behind bars. Just be prepared never to see the outside world again. My life is over. Crying out, my husband was immobilized by me and Richard. We then called the police, and soon after, officers arrived and took him away. Paul was later interrogated and seems to have confessed. A large amount of medication was detected in the coffee, sealing his fate. Aware of the severity of his crimes, he seemed to have resigned himself to his fate, losing all energy in life. As for myself, I divorced Paul and demanded a compensation of $30,000 from him and $10,000 from Nancy. And as for Richard, he said he is going to move on with his life. After all the procedures were completed, I moved to a new home, ready for a fresh start. I've been assigned new tasks at work and despite the challenges, I feel the most fulfilled I've ever been. Get back home and start cooking quickly. That was the first thing my husband blurted out over the phone while I was at work. When he got home, he was visibly upset that dinner wasn't ready. Even though I had explained to him that I'm in the middle of a big project at work and it's a crucial time, he still clings to the old-fashioned belief that housework is a woman's job. You're obviously using work as an excuse to skip out on chores. I'll give you a piece of my mind when you get back. Despite having ended the call, my phone's notification light kept flashing incessantly. It was as if it was reflecting my husband's unending anger, causing me to sigh repeatedly. I'm Natalie, 40 years old. Earlier this year, I was promoted to a managerial position. Until I got married to Matthew, who is six years my senior, three years ago, my life was all about work. After getting married, I thought about scaling back my work, but then came the unexpected promotion. Now, with more responsibilities, my workload has only increased. Nonetheless, I've been trying to balance housework as best as I can. But feeling the strain of juggling both, I've asked Matthew to help out. Please, can't you help out a bit with the chores? What? Why should I do it? I'm the head of this household. But we're a dual-income couple without kids. I think it's only fair you do some housework. Despite having those discussions many times, he eventually went and complained to my mother-in-law. Truth be told, mother-in-law is quite a tricky character. Of course, the wife should do all the housework. You're failing as a wife. She would say. Every time I see her, she gives me a hard time. Plus, she, who loves designer brands, always mocks my work-appropriate jacket and pants style as drab and cheap. Before I knew it, I was constantly receiving snide remarks from my mother-in-law and fighting with my husband, who doesn't understand the concept of a dual-income couple. All this leaves me with little hope for the future and a growing sense of despair. Then, one day, as I finished work and opened the front door of my house, I saw in-law's shoes. Are they both here? This is going to be troublesome. Just as I dreaded, my mother-in-law, standing tall, started lecturing me as expected. I've been waiting for you, Natalie. Leaving the house empty till this hour because of work. You really don't understand your role as a wife. Yeah, sorry. I replied, too tired to argue, enduring the hunger and her relentless sarcasm. While she was going on with her one-sided sermon, my father-in-law was lounging on the sofa, an annoying sight, but I couldn't bring myself to say anything. A wife who neglects her home is a worry for our old age. We should move in together immediately. That's a bit. Your opinion doesn't matter. We've already planned to move in with you and even arranged a mortgage for a suitable house. Standing beside her, my husband listened to our conversation, then confidently and excitedly approached me with his news. Seeing his proud face, she looked very pleased. I couldn't help but feel completely excluded. That's exactly why I don't want that. If you don't like living with my parents, then let's get a divorce. That's impossible. Because. He cut me off, refusing to listen and, as usual, imposing his own opinions. Then just do as I, the man of the house, say. Don't act so high and mighty just because you work at a major company. Women should be quiet and obedient. 
It crossed my mind that he might not even remember our previous discussions. They, apparently giving up on my input, were excitedly discussing the new house. We'll have separate entrances in the new house for us. You guys will want your own entrance, right? Feel free to boss Natalie around whatever you need. Thank you, you are so thoughtful. A wife is like a free housekeeper, I'll use her to my heart's content. Despite the headache-inducing conversation, with the house loan already taken, I had no choice but to let Matthew have his way. Two weeks later, on my rare day off, my in-laws suddenly moved into our house. Without any prior notice, mother-in-law, with her piles of luggage, barged in as if she owned the place. Matthew was out, and when I tried to call him to figure out what was happening, he didn't answer. My mother-in-law, in her usual flashy, embroidered designer clothes, started ordering me around as if it was the most natural thing. My father-in-law sank deeply into the sofa, showing no intention of helping. Clear out those cheap bags and clothes from your room. We're using your closet and bed from today. A semi-double bed is too much for you. You can sleep in the hallway. What? Didn't you hear me? Get moving. Wait a minute. Weren't we supposed to move in together only after getting the new house? Our house sold quicker than expected. Starting today, I'm going to retrain you to be a proper wife. She twisted her mouth maliciously, seeming to enjoy the moment. She completely ignored everything I said. Just thinking about starting life with father-in-law, who wouldn't even move things in front of him, weighed heavily on my heart. Doing as I was told, I began taking my clothes and bags out of my room, to her satisfaction. You're always wearing the same clothes despite your good salary, and you don't even own a designer bag. Yeah, I don't really focus on that stuff. That's why you're so plain and boring. You must have a lot saved up since you don't spend. Not really. Lying again. She mocking laughter, now even more spiteful, made me feel like she was targeting my savings. Also, you'll be buying all new appliances and furniture when we move to the new house. We only brought our clothes and newly acquired golf gear. She made decisions without listening to my opinion. Biting back what I wanted to say, I focused on tidying up. Not owning much, I quickly moved my belongings from my room to storage. Now it's time to store our important stuff. Hurry up. I placed her clothes and father-in-law's golf bags in the closet I had been using. She looked very satisfied watching this. As I was finishing up, my husband returned home and happily addressed me, seeing the situation. First of all, it was a luxury for a wife like you to even have a room. Leave it to my mother, and you'll become a proper wife. This is just the beginning. I'll drill into you what it means to be a wife. True to her word, the next day I was woken up at dawn to prepare breakfast for everyone, including sandwiches I had never before made for my husband. My mother-in-law just watched, offering no help. After completing everything and heading to work, she would call to order me to do shopping, and upon returning home, there was no rest, only dinner preparation. By the time I finished washing the dishes, my husband and mother-in-law were enjoying their shower time. Exhausted, as I headed to shower, she added. Use the stored water in the bathtub to wash yourself. You don't get the luxury of a shower. Entering the shower room silently, I found the water dirty and unappealing. Remember, use the stored water. I was shocked when the shower door suddenly opened. All I wanted was some privacy in the shower, but she wouldn't even allow me that. Why must I endure this when I'm the one paying the high heating bill? I'm so tired. Why are wives always looked down upon, regardless of the era? I could just refuse, but to avoid further conflicts, I told myself it was just temporary endurance. Of course, my husband showed no concern for me. In fact, he started exploiting me more. Hey Natalie, bring me beer and snacks. Lately, he just lounged on the sofa, playing games. Angered, I glared at him, and he yelled back. Don't get cocky. You just need to listen to me and my mother. I felt strongly that there was no one on my side in this house. A month into this hellish life, reaching my limit, I got a call from a real estate agent during lunch break. 
I had been secretly preparing to leave the house. Finally, the day I've been waiting for. I can be free. The next morning, with an innocent expression, I carried my suitcase to the living room where they were. I'll be on a business trip to Los Angeles for a few days. What an arrogant way to say it. Make sure to buy gifts. Don't forget there's a mountain of housework waiting when you get back. And so, I left the house. The business trip was a lie, I moved into my new house straight after work. Alone for the first time in a while, I felt an overwhelming sense of happiness. From now on, I'll live for myself. I resolved in my heart. Starting that day, I blocked my husband's calls and cut off all communication. A week later, my husband, unable to hide his irritation at my not returning home, was lurking behind a pillar at my workplace. As soon as he saw me, he rushed over and grabbed my arm tightly. His eyes were wild, his face flushed, glaring at me threateningly. I knew it. You were back from your trip already. Let's go home. No, I'm not going back. What nonsense are you spouting? How dare you, a wife, act like this? Do you want a divorce that badly? Yes. No one will take you in after me. Actually, we're already divorced, so we're strangers now. You haven't forgotten, have you? Huh? You slapped a divorce paper in my face three months ago after a huge fight. What? Did you file it? His voice trembled as he asked for confirmation. When I affirmed, he was visibly shocked and disoriented. In fact, before my in-laws arrived, he had suggested living together. I naturally refused, and in anger, he presented the divorce papers. I made good use of them. But just recently, when I said if you didn't like living together we should divorce, you said that's impossible. We're already divorced. It's ridiculous to live together when we're separated, isn't it? Then why were you living with us? I bought a new apartment but couldn't move in immediately. I was told it would take one to two months, and after spending much of my savings on the apartment, I couldn't afford a hotel. He was stunned, not only that the divorce was already final, but also that I had purchased an apartment. His previously flushed face turned pale. Now that you understand, are we done here? Not at all. That's joint property, right? I bought it with money I saved before marriage, so it's my personal property. Seriously? Oh, right. Your stuff is still there, come get it. You're just saying that to get your parents to persuade me. I've seen through all your plans. I've packed everything I need in my suitcase. I've even reserved luxury furniture from famous brands. For a moment, he looked envious. Had he cherished me, this wouldn't have been the outcome. Such a pity. I don't accept this. I'm cancelling the divorce. As I said, you're the one who slapped the divorce papers on me. Even if you take it to court, it'll be a waste of effort. Look, I'm in trouble without you. I can't pay off the mortgage for the house we bought together. I was counting on splitting it with you since you earn more. Then he started to cry. I was astonished to hear he relied on my salary to buy the house. Doing the math, at 45 years old, Matthew took out a 35-year mortgage. He'd be 80 by the time it's paid off. It's none of my concern now. You'll have to pay it all yourself. No, no, no. Don't be cold, help me find a solution. We were married once, after all. Your parents have the money from selling their house. Use that. Well, actually, they didn't sell the house. It was auctioned off due to my parents defaulting on the loan. What did they spend the money on? Designer clothes, bags, and dad's expensive golf gear. I was shocked. They really intended to live off me. The day they moved in, my suspicion that they were after my money wasn't unfounded. I'm glad I divorced. I felt reassured about my decision. Despite their precarious situation, they gambled, hoping for a big win. They ended up borrowing dangerously and lost everything. Now, just paying the interest is a struggle. I refuse to spend my life with such people. Never contact me again. Then my ex-husband blurted out something ridiculous. 
The house we bought is joint property since we bought it before the divorce. What? You have a duty to pay the mortgage. It's in your name. If it's recently bought, selling it won't even cover the deficit. If you think I'm lying, check it out. Then let's get back together. I have no intention of returning to a husband who looks down on me as a wife. What nonsense he was speaking. He didn't understand how awful his actions were. Then lend me money. Sleep talking is meant to happen while you are sleeping. By the way, our joint savings had $10,000, so I took $5,000 as my share. Goodbye forever. If you ambush me again, I'll call the police. Matthew collapsed as if knocked out. I walked past him and returned to my home. Feeding their extravagant parents and paying the mortgage must be hellish. I didn't expect to be ambushed again, but just to be safe, I changed to a new mobile phone and got a different number. The house my ex-husband bought, intended for co-living, was auctioned off within a year due to my in-law's presence causing delays in mortgage and property tax payments. Relying on my income for the new house, it was obviously difficult for them to make payments once I left. Later, my in-laws created more debt for themselves and failed to repay it, leading to debt collector's arrival. I heard they were forced into labor at a place arranged by the collectors, having to give up their cherished designer items and luxury golf clubs. Matthew, of course, with no money, ended up living in an old apartment with dubious stains on the floor and no shower. In such a state, it's unlikely he'll find a new wife. I'm enjoying my days, excited about life in my new apartment. The freedom to live without anyone's orders, just relaxing, is blissful. Living alone is the best. Didn't you hear me? So, a high school graduate is even poor in hearing. I'm saying I want my child to be born to a more accomplished woman. My genes are too good to be wasted on a mere high school grad. Before we got married, my husband used to say that educational background didn't matter in love. Now, he berates me, a high school graduate, as trash and says he's leaving to remarry a woman with an elite college degree. Oh man, what a misfortune to have a wife with such low education. I'm truly unlucky. With those parting words, he left to elope with the elite college graduate woman. My name is Megan and I turned 27 this year. I married Leo, three years my senior. I'm a high school graduate working as an office worker in a trading company, and I met him through a friend from high school. Unlike me, he graduated from a prestigious university and works in sales at a major corporation, a true elite. Initially, I felt unworthy of such an amazing person, but every time we met, educational background doesn't matter. I like you for who you are. He would say, I believed his words and married him. But now, I regret that decision. As soon as we got married, he started looking down on me for my education and income. To him, a high school grad working at a small trading company, I might seem like an underachiever. But it was he who wanted to marry me. During our relationship, sensing my inferiority complex, he comforted me with kind words, now a shadow of his former self. Megan, you should find a new job. It's embarrassing to have a wife working for such a low-income company. He says this without any remorse. But I don't want to go to a busier company right now, especially since we're trying to conceive. Besides, I like my current job and the company. My voice fades under his cold gaze. He sighs in annoyance and retreats to the bedroom before I can say anything else. He probably thought I was going to talk about trying to conceive again. He is right. I wanted to have some time to talk with him about trying to conceive and not making any progress. I've been wanting to have a child since we got married, and he used to be enthusiastic about having three siblings. But now, there's no hope of having a child. Whenever I gently ask for his cooperation in trying to conceive, I don't want to raise a child born to a high school grad. He avoids me, saying. Shocked by his words, I've been unable to have a proper conversation with him. Our marriage feels empty, he constantly belittles me, demanding gratitude for picking up an elite like himself, and pushes all household chores onto me. Lately, he's even started skimping on living expenses. 
Apparently, he thinks I spend too much and should save more. I've been cutting back as much as possible, but sometimes I have to dip into my savings from before we were married. I should naturally want a divorce by now, but I can't bring myself to say it to him. I'm afraid of how he might react. Plus, I don't want to betray my parents, who were so happy about our marriage and looking forward to their first grandchild. As our marriage grew colder, he spent less and less time at home. Coming home in the morning became the norm. When he did come home late at night, he'd wake me up to make him snacks, among other outrageous behaviors. And every time he returned late at night, I could smell women's perfume on him. Even without a woman's intuition, it was clear he was cheating. But I was too scared to confront the truth. Then, one day, he said he was leaving. My real girlfriend is finally pregnant. I'm moving in with her tomorrow. I was stunned. Didn't you hear me? A high school grad is even bad at listening. My superior genes are too good for someone like you. He ranted without being asked. He had been cheating, and the woman was a younger graduate from the same prestigious university as him. She got pregnant, so he decided to cut ties with me and remarry her. She was a new employee, you see. Getting married and taking maternity leave right after joining would affect her career. And since I'm such a great catch, I get a lot of introductions to women from my boss. So I thought I'd marry some convenient woman until she finished her rookie year. That convenient woman turned out to be me. With no need to hide anything anymore, his face was more hideous than I'd ever seen. You work for a trading company, right? Even if it's small, I thought you might have some useful connections or manufacturers. But what a mistake. You have no decent contacts, and all you do is nag about kids, being just a high school grad. He said that, looking at me. As I stood there speechless, he laughed mockingly and stood up from the sofa. Oh man. To be married to such a low-educated woman. I am truly unfortunate. A worthless woman like you wasting my precious time. Without even a glance at me, he walked out the front door. I listened to the sound of the door locking and took deep breaths. My tense body slowly relaxed and cold sweat broke out all over me. Now that I understood Leo's scheme, I had no hesitation. I quickly had my dinner and secluded myself in my room before he returned. The next day, I left home early for work and picked up divorce papers. My hands trembling with nerves, I managed to open the door to find no sign of Leo. His favorite sofa in the living room was also gone. Searching the house, I found all of his belongings missing. I hadn't seen him since he left yesterday. On the table, I saw a stack of papers and a thin envelope. Turning over his neatly written note, I found completed divorce papers. The note said, I've told the in-laws, so don't contact me again. I emotionlessly filled in the blanks on the divorce papers. Not a tear was shed. After finishing, I picked up the envelope marked settlement money. Inside, there were only $2,000. Perhaps he intended it as compensation for the divorce. Though far too little, I could use it to hire a lawyer for a proper settlement claim. I was planning to visit a law firm on the weekend when I received a call. It was from the house management company, saying the rent for the last and current month was overdue. Unable to reach Leo, they called my mobile. My savings, already depleted from covering living expenses, were insufficient. I had no choice but to use the $2,000 from the envelope. At the law firm, they told me it would be difficult to claim more. Most of the money left by him had already been spent on rent. It seemed that by using the rent money, I had accepted the settlement from Leo. Since we lived together, I had an obligation to pay rent. Knowing I had no savings, he must have deliberately left the $2,000 to prevent me from taking further action. I had unwittingly used the money he left. With no savings and most of my income going to rent, I couldn't afford to live there. I began searching for cheaper accommodation and soon moved back to my parents' house after informing them of the divorce. The shock made me never want to marry again, but my parents thought differently. Back home, they encouraged me daily, saying I was still young enough for marriage and children. Feeling guilty about disappointing them.
I started looking for a new partner while commuting to my now distant job. I filled my schedule quickly, perhaps to distract myself. Maybe I wanted to overwrite that nightmarish marriage with a fulfilling life. My efforts bore fruit sooner than expected. During my search for a partner, I clicked with a man, and two years after my divorce, I was remarried and had a daughter. My new husband, Anthony, was the same age as me and also a high school graduate. He worked at a car repair shop near my parents' house and we met at a local marriage party. Anthony was self-conscious about being a high school graduate, but I never chose people based on their education, unlike my ex-husband. Anthony never cared about my education either and was always generous and never looked down on people. We set up our new home near my parents' house, and I was busy yet happy with work and raising our child. In the whirlwind of days, I had long forgotten Leo, my ex-husband. It was about 10 years after the divorce when I unexpectedly ran into him. I was at a German language speech competition with my daughter. Is that Megan? I turned around when a man called out from behind. Though he had aged in the last decade, I recognized that face I wished I could forget. Next to Leo stood a boy about the same age as my daughter. Noticing my gaze, he said with an untroubled smile, he's my son with Olivia. She's an elite, a state university graduate. We're paying a lot for his gifted education. Olivia must be the college graduate he eloped with. He bragged about his child's intelligence, ignoring me. As I remained silent, he glanced at my daughter. Where's your husband? Let me guess, he's a high school grad too, right? It was true, but admitting that my husband was also a high school graduate would only invite more insults. Wanting to avoid trouble, I didn't confirm or deny, but quickly left with my daughter. I knew it, children of high school grads have a different look. Just like those foolish faces around here. No way such a child can speak decent German. He said mockingly, stepping in front of us. I was stunned by his audacity to look down on others, even children, in front of his own child. Though my daughter didn't understand the meaning of high school grad, she sensed she was being insulted and her face twisted as if she was about to cry. Seeing this, I glared at him. Can't you stop insulting even children? Aren't you ashamed as a dad? My anger didn't faze him. It's the truth. A high school grad's child participating in a German contest is absurd. Such children should just play in the park. He said his piece and disappeared into the crowd with his child. Anger boiled within me, but seeing my daughter's anxious face, I composed myself. It's okay, you've practiced a lot. Just do like we did at home, and you'll win. Mom guarantees it. I spoke to her quietly, meeting her eyes. As her mother, I had to be strong. She nodded slowly, digesting my words. After registering, I took my seat in the audience. Now, it was just a matter of trusting my child's abilities. I took a deep breath, waiting for the competition to start. Most children, including Leo, were overwhelmed by nerves and the atmosphere, giving poor speeches. My daughter, however, spoke fluently and clearly, the best of all the participants. My prediction was right. She won the German speech competition. Leaving the venue with her, holding a large bouquet and wearing a medal around her neck. We planned to celebrate at a fancy restaurant. Megan! Wait! A loud voice called from behind. I quickly shielded my daughter and turned to face Leo. His child's eyes were red from crying. Enviously looking at my daughter's medal. It's ridiculous that your child won. A child raised by a high school grad speaking so well. He was upset that his child hadn't won, and my daughter had. Assuming we couldn't possibly speak German, he ranted. People exiting the venue watched him curiously, but he seemed oblivious. Which school did you send her to? Or did you hire a tutor from your meager earnings? I haven't enrolled her in any classes, nor have I hired a tutor. When I stated this simply, he looked at me incredulously. There's no way. You can't even speak German properly. Have you forgotten what I do? He looked puzzled. Working in a trading company's office, you need a decent command of German. Plus, grandpa lives in Germany, so I grew up hearing German. 
my daughter learned it naturally through conversations with him. I patted my daughter's head, who was peeking from behind me. I've been speaking German with my grandfather since I was a child. I chose to work in the trading company to utilize my German skills. When my daughter was born, we often video called him to show him her growth, and she naturally started speaking German. I never forced German education on her. But gradually, she began watching German cartoons on streaming sites and picking up German books for kids at bookstores. Anthony and I just supported her interests. It seems my daughter, naturally interacting with my grandfather, became fluent enough to converse without a translator. Leo started to shiver. With anger as I explained. His face flushed with humiliation, unable to accept defeat from someone he looked down upon. That's unbelievable. I'll complain to the organizers. My child has been unfairly judged. He stormed back into the venue, leaving his child alone. Unable to leave his child unattended, I waited silently for him to return. Soon, two security guards escorted him out of the venue. He gritted his teeth, clearly upset by my daughter's victory. As he approached brazenly, a woman's voice unexpectedly called out to him. Leo, what a coincidence to see you here! The woman, wearing a neat pantsuit and a speech competition staff badge, caught his attention. With her arrival, he calmed his anger and tensed up. Unable to leave, I stood there with my daughter hidden behind me, watching the scene. Do you have a child, Leo? I heard you were single, is she your wife? I shook my head to her unexpected question. No, he's my ex-husband. Then, is this child yours and Leo's? She eyed the boy standing beside Leo. No, that's his child with the woman he married after our divorce. Her eyes sharpened. Leo, pale and sweating, couldn't hide his shock. The aftermath was predictable. Sensing trouble, I quickly left the scene. Turns out, Leo, after marrying a college graduate, had been falsely claiming to be single and was involved with a woman who graduated from a prestigious foreign university. She was involved in organizing the speech competition and realized she was the other woman when she saw him with his child. His wife's fury over the affair exploded. The next day, she took their child and returned to her parents' home. Now, Leo is burdened with child support until his child reaches adulthood, compensation for the affair, and education loan payments. Rumors spread uncontrollably, revealing his pattern of switching women based on their education, leading to his forced resignation. My daughter later participated in a national German speech competition. Though she didn't win, her near-native proficiency drew attention, deepening her interest in German. Encouraged by Anthony, I left the trading company. And now, I started a German language school at home, also assisting my grandfather with novel translations.